Welcome to another e-service for Emmanuel Evangelical Lutheran Church of Paynes Point. That's in rural Oregon, Illinois. These videos are designed to serve as a stand-in for our regular Sunday morning worship for those unable to attend in person for any reason. Therefore, this is designed to be participatory. Feel free to pray, confess, and sing along with us. An announcement or two may be included, but please mind your emails and the newsletter to know what's going on in the congregation. Good morning. Just a few announcements following up on last week. Uh, we should have a Wednesday night video go live at 7 o'clock on Wednesday. I should be able to get that done. The council meeting that I announced last week was delayed till this week and both my sense of how much time do I have and the reason for the delay is uh, first prayer concern here Robin has been in at uh, Kish Hospital with bacterial pneumonia since last Sunday she'd been having some breathing trouble that wasn't uncommon for her this kind of year but it became evident over the weekend that she needed uh, to see somebody and so She's been treated for that. I'm recording this a little early. It's technically possible that she's home, but I'm expecting that she's not <laughs> as of Sunday morning here. Uh, and another prayer concern on that front, a family friend of theirs, uh, Steve Johnson, who was, um, his family's connected to the stagecoach where we've done the dinner and a show nights in DeKalb. So I'm not sure if anybody, if there's any direct connections, but you've at least encountered, if you've been to one of those shows, you've almost certainly encountered either his father or his mother or some other members of his family. Well, he found out very recently, I think maybe two weeks ago, that he had a uh, aggressive form of cancer and it was already in stage four and then they were considering options and that and, and it went very fast. He uh, on Wednesday night, which is last night from today, I'm recording a little early, um, I announced that this is a prayer concern because it went from um, not sure what his options were and likely only a few months to live to maybe more like a few weeks or days. And it turns out he actually passed away around when I was sharing that. So we'll be remembering Steve's family in our prayers for the next few weeks. Um, very sad, very quick. It was young, in his 50s, has kids at home, that sort of thing. So, okay, it's a bit of a somber note to start on, but it is Lent. So, let's get started. <laughs> Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from the ninth chapter of Genesis. God said, This is the sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for all future generations. I have set my bow in the clouds, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. 
When I bring clouds over the earth and the bow is seen in the clouds, I will remember my covenant that is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth, God said to Noah. This is the sign of the covenant that I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth. Then God said to Noah and to his sons with him, As for me, I am establishing my covenant with you and your descendants after you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal of the earth with you, as many as came out of the ark. I establish my covenant with you, that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood, and never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. Here ends the reading. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. 
Holy God, Heavenly Father, in the waters of the flood, you saved the chosen. And in the wilderness of temptation, you protected your son from sin. Renew us in the gift of baptism. May your holy angels be with us, that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our second reading comes from the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness for 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. This is the gospel of our Lord. Grace and peace to you, sisters and brothers in Christ. Remember just very recently when I said Mark uses immediately as a keyword, how that sets the tone of his whole gospel? Mark's style of writing is such that he doesn't mark things in the calendar as much as the others, and he doesn't give as many side stories in between the big events. Instead, we're meant to feel a sense of urgency and immediacy between those big events. Jesus will take a moment here or there to withdraw, but spends most of his day going from one task to the next. And if you didn't know that, you might be a bit thrown off balance by what we just heard from Mark. Because you may well remember a fair amount of what's going on here today. I dare say after Christmas, this is the season even non-churchgoers know the most about. Like, Lent is 40 days long because Jesus spent 40 days in the wilderness. And that we fast give something up or add a discipline during this time to honor Jesus fasting out in the wilderness during that time. Whether you heard it in worship or Sunday school or you just have a a passing familiarity with Lent and why we do this, you may even be familiar with a few more details. Like, isn't the temptation supposed to be something about turning stones to food? Wasn't Jesus tempted to jump off of some big building? And didn't Satan try to get Jesus to worship him rather than God? Those three temptations of these 40 days have been the source of, along with the fast for that matter, have been the source of many sermons over the years. They're used as a lens through which we might examine ourselves, the church, the world, Jesus, even Satan. Mark doesn't record any of them. Now, maybe that's simply his style. Or maybe it's a a practicality of history. Whomever Jesus gave the details of what happened out there, he was alone, Maybe that person hadn't passed it along to Mark. Mark is the first gospel, most certainly the first gospel to be written down, at least, but I don't think it's something quite so mm, practical. Instead, maybe Mark wants us to focus on a few key details, at least sometimes. So let's give that a try. Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and then the Spirit drives him out into the wilderness. Again, it's happening really fast, and there he's tempted by Satan. One of the few details we get. And Satan, as you recall, in Hebrew, means something like prosecuting attorney or accuser. Satan's job among the other angels is to show where humans fall short, where we're guilty. It only makes sense that we'd regard such a figure as our enemy. If God considered us innocent, the last thing we'd want is (laughs) someone coming around and trying to convince God otherwise. Sounds like something an enemy would do. But the courtroom imagery might be a little bit misleading for us nowadays with our changing culture because our day in court, if you have one, is is about whether or not you did a particular thing. If you're innocent or guilty, it depends on whether you did that thing or why you did it. It's about an event. The heavenly courtroom is more about character, like your whole life. It assumes that your actions, intentions, circumstances, your character are all so intimately interconnected that there's hardly any worth mentioning that, you know, you're guilty, you really did do that thing, but you didn't really do this. Because it's bigger than this and that. It's whether you're in right standing before God. Is your life as a whole consistent with what God has created you to be, what God has called you to do? So we do the text a disservice by simply calling it Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. It's not like 
Oh, I mean, this is another change in context. It's not like he's tempted to eat another piece of cake. This isn't a temptation to sleep in a little more or skip his workout. The way we use tempted in English today almost always means there's something over there that I probably shouldn't do, but I kind of want to. It's drawing me in that direction. We're missing on one of those key details that Mark leaves in. Because the word woulda, coulda, shoulda, in my opinion, been translated test. Because again, this isn't about guilt over one particular action. It's about who you really are, or in this case, who Jesus really is. Because again, we're not given a lot of details. Jesus is baptized and declared the Son of God by the voice from heaven. And a moment later, he's being tested. Mark puts that right there together. We can surmise then that the test is to see what exactly does it mean to be the Son of God? What kind of Messiah will Jesus be? What is different about Jesus than the rest of humanity or other prophets or rabbis? Okay, so let's bring it back around then. I claimed Mark keeps it brief and only includes these few details, perhaps so we'd focus in on them and see what we find if we just focus on those few. Well, here's one idea. This short passage has a lot of key figures. In fact, to the original audience of Mark, it's got nearly all of the key players that precede Jesus' public ministry. John the Baptist prepared the way. He's preaching repentance that a big change will come. He's roused and gathered crowds so they're ready to hear from Jesus when he comes preaching. Jesus' baptism marks the beginning of his public ministry. So we're at a transition here because the text starts with John baptizing and ends with John being arrested. It's not just a transition for Jesus, but also for John. There's a, an implied passing of the torch. While John's in prison, Jesus will get to the work that John was doing before. While John frames the text as to what a, you know, the public things people would witness, like anyone who was around on earth would see this, Mark gives us insight into the hel- heavenly realm with what comes in between. God the Father declares Jesus the beloved Son, and God the Spirit drives him out into the wilderness to begin his ministry. The most notable heavenly figure, then, who's not a person of the Trinity, is Satan, and he's right there doing his job as well. Jesus, incarnate as human, can be tested by Satan, so he is. The result? Well, we don't get many details beyond what's implied. Jesus will carry on with his ministry, so it's safe to say he passed any tests presented out there. But more than that, we do get this one quick little note. Angels waited on him among the wild beasts. Sounds like if Satan was testing him to see who Jesus really was, he found Jesus to be something rather special. No ordinary person has angels wait on them while beasts sit by. No ordinary person would have the heavenly realm and the chaos of nature both conform to him, to support him during his time of trial. That right there may be the point of narrowing it down to just these few details. That heaven and earth are in alignment when it comes to Jesus in a way they simply had never been. The three persons of the Trinity, the angels, including Satan, are all acting in agreement with who Jesus is and what Jesus does. And the earthly realm moves to conform as well, from picking up where John left off to wild beasts sitting by. So then, let's close out with the regular question. What does any of that have to do with us? Well, two things. First, you're not Jesus. Heaven and earth don't conform to us. Any message that takes this story and claims something like, well, Jesus defeated Satan, so you can too, or anything like that, that's missing the point. The point is Jesus can pass this test, defeat Satan, even though virtually no one else can. Don't let this text suggest to you that since you were baptized, you woulda, coulda, shoulda lived sinlessly. That's not it. Second, and this one comes up a lot, but it bears repeating, Jesus is who he is because of what he does, and he does what he does because of who he is. And Jesus demonstrates and asserts his authority as one who has power over earthly things and supernatural matters. It is precisely because heaven and earth conform to him that when he speaks of our life and our salvation, us on heaven and on earth, that we can believe what he says. He does not He's not just one more voice among many. He's the voice. He's the one that could pass any test Satan would throw at him, and that assures you of your salvation despite any test Satan could throw at you. 
He goes to the wilderness for the same reason he goes to the cross and everywhere else for our sake. Even if there's wild beasts afoot, imprisonment of his friend, all manner of hardship around us, all these things in their time conform to him. And Jesus advocates, advocates on our behalf. Therefore, at the end of the day and at the end of the age, we trust what he says when he says we are safe, when he says we are saved. Amen. With that, I invite you to confess the faith of the Church using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. In Jesus, your realm has come near to us in every place and time. Give your church throughout the world a spirit of humility and repentance. Teach us to trust always in the good news of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy. You have made a covenant of mercy with every living creature. Protect all earth's creatures from destruction. Empower the work of biologists, conservationists, and science educators. And be with those affected by the recent storms, especially those in Texas without water or power. Lord, in your mercy. All your paths are steadfast love and faithfulness. Direct the words and actions of leaders in our community and throughout the world that they may maintain justice for the lowly. We pray especially for those who may be in harm's way as they strive for justice, police officers, firefighters, soldiers, and more. We pray especially for John, Josh, Tyler, Morgan, Jack, Robert, Matt, Nick, and Dane. Lord, in your mercy. Even in the wilderness, you are with us. Walk alongside migrants, refugees, those crossing dangerous lands. Tend to those whose lives feel desolate. Give healing and strength to all who suffer. We pray especially for those whose needs are ongoing. For Jerry, Joe, Jim, Robin, Renee's Aunt Charlene, Gail, Lisa, Chloe, Connie, Larry, Cindy, John, and Melody, Grace, Danny, Doug, Bailey, Connie, Kendall, Jean, Horst, 
Richard, Serenata, Anne, Carol, and Jean. Edie, Leona, Amy, Dean, Andrea, Dennis, Lynette, Ida, and Mabel, Steve and Crystal, Alan, and we remember today Robin in need of healing and wholeness. We pray wisdom and guidance for her doctors, nurses, and other health care uh, workers. We pray that you give her a full and speedy recovery. Lord, in your mercy, in the covenant of baptism, you claim us as beloved children. Nurture us in our baptismal identity and teach us to live within it for the sake of others. Strengthen this congregation's ministries of care and concern. Lord, in your mercy. In baptism, you join us to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We praise you for all who, those who have died trusting in your faithfulness. Bring us with them to the fullness of your reign. And in this age, give us peace, comfort, and strength. We pray especially for Steve's family with such a sudden and recent horrific loss. We pray that you'd be with his wife and children, his parents and others who cared for him so much. Give them strength to face the days ahead, comfort that, and peace that surpass understanding. Give them confidence in the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who first taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And as you take a moment to share a greeting, a sign of peace, let me first remind you that during this tumultuous time, as to minimize his exposure, most every gift given and received is going through the mail directly to the financial secretary. So when we pray uh, in our remote service here, we're praying over those gifts given and received, however they were. And secondly, uh, I won't spell it out, but just see if you notice what's different in the prayer here and see if you can remember why that is. And maybe we'll circle back to that next week. So with that, let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in the desert places and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this journey that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And as you go forth responsibly into your own home, know that you are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news. Thanks be to God.